Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Pop Goes the Sixties. Today, John Heaton joins me for another review of a Beatles solo album. And today we're going to be talking about George Harrison's 33 and a third. How are you doing, John? Yeah, I'm good, Matt. Are you okay? Uh, I'm okay. Jolly I'm okay. good. <laughs> Jolly good, yeah. <laughs> so I, this album, um, I just want to start by saying, I just moved to This Is My New Place, and I'm in the process of still getting it all together. And as I was packing up my old place, I was working in the kitchen, and I'm packing up, and I put on 33 and a third because I knew, you know, I was planning for you and I to do this, this review and I hadn't heard the album in a while. So I put it on and I just loved it. I'm singing. I, I was, I, I should have had the camera rolling. I was really enjoying the album. I think this is one of George's best albums and it's coming off kind of two of his probably worst albums. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the accepted wisdom. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I completely agree with that, but it's definitely more upbeat and optimistic. So in that sense, it's, yeah, it's quite rewarding as a listener if you're in the mood. I find it a little, we'll get to the criticism, but maybe a little bit slick would be a minor criticism. But mm. uh, on the whole, you know, that's a good thing. Very well produced by George himself, I believe, right? I don't think there's anyone helping him or is it tom i scott? think tom scott did help him on it and uh yeah, but I, yeah we'll talk about that I, this this album is a pronounced change from what he had been doing and uh we'll give some background too because it was not a it was a rocky background to creating this album and somehow he comes up with this really positive and um bright album yep so well yeah you had mentioned uh the reviews i think generally the reviews are pretty positive i've got a couple here i'll just rattle off here michael gross wrote in swank magazine harrison's seems to have come unstuck richard Meltzer of village voice described harrison's new work as quote his best lp since all things must pass and on par with villain's blood on the tracks wow that's high praise uh although ken tucker of rolling stone mentioned george per george's persistent preaching i don't find this a very preachy album do you no, because it's because it's just more upbeat and 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 some of the lyrics are, you know, you could take it both ways. You know, a song written about God, like Dear One, or written to a partner, and you just the listener can read into whatever whatever they whatever they like. So compared mm -hmm. to Material World, it's not preachy, but I have to say, of of the two, I I'd vote for Material World all day long in terms of the song quality. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, th there's there's something about George's spirit here and, and his, his joie de vivre, even though, as you say, he was ill, it hepatitis leading up to it. Mm -hmm. um, he just comes across as very positive, which hasn't always been the case, should we say. Yeah, one of the interesting quotes was from Nicholas Schaffner, who said that comparing it with All Things Must Pass, said that the so songs on 33 and a third rely on pure melody and George's own musicianship instead of dazzling orchestration and production. So you had mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about the production on this album in a little bit, but I thought that was an interesting quote from Schaffner. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that, which is really works is, is George has made a conscious effort, but like he did on Cloud Nine later, just to make sure that his guitar featured prominently. And there's several tracks with beautiful guitar playing Whereas on extra texture, you would struggle to find one solo, really, wouldn't you? Yeah, and that even has this guitar can't keep from crying on it, doesn't it? Is that on texture or is that on dark cars? Yeah, that's on texture, but it's, okay. it's not really a solo, is it? It's, it's no. It's quite nice guitar playing on that, but not. he's not really letting go, is he? Um, no, I, and that's one of the criticisms I've had of George Harrison's solo career is the lack of guitar playing from him. And I agree with you. I think this this album does feature some guitar. Uh, more than the last couple of albums and very nice guitar very well played yep. and uh we'll talk about that too when we talk about the individual individual tracks yeah so some of the background i know that he was writing this uh well he signed a new deal uh dark horse records this is the first album on dark horse which was originally uh distributed to be distributed by AM records and he was writing this in the virgin islands he was with eric idol so maybe that accounts for some of the uplifting i mean you got like eric idol around maybe you're going to be a little more um uh, there's there's a, there's a sense of humor on this album clearly that i don't find on the previous couple of albums 
Yeah, the only sense of humor and noticeable in extra texture is in the packaging, right? <laughs> yes, I would say that that is in some of the liner notes. Yeah, which yeah. are slightly cynical as well. But um, yeah, and I know that as they were when they were in uh, the Virgin Islands, they were creating. They, they must have been having some parties because they were uh, uh, disturbing um, some of the neighbors, which was Norman Lear and his wife in a neighboring house that they must have been renting or they owned. So that was one of the things that came up when I was researching this. Yeah. But the other thing that was also looming over George during this time was the he's so fine um, plagiarism suit from all, um, My Sweet Lord. So that was all going on at this time, too. So, uh, you know, if people know the story, George Harrison was sued for My Sweet Lord, and it was a plagiarism of He's So Fine, and that was what was being decided in court. And uh, he ended up having to pay like oh, half a million dollars yeah. actually to Alan Klein, who had, who actually had acquired the rights to the, he's so fine. So in a strange yeah. twist. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. industry... <clears throat> and also what's interesting is if you look at the musicians on this album, quite a few of them all played on extra texture as well, like David Foster, but somehow he's got a completely different feel. Um, Willie Weeks on bass he'd used before, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think it just must be the mixing or the production because Alvin Taylor's drumming is brilliant and a gr he makes a great rhythm section with Willie Weeks. Uh, Billy Preston had obviously featured before, so it's not a completely new lineup, but he seems to get a new kind of feel, new groove. Generally speaking, you know, George Harrison, just like John Lennon and Ringo Starr, when they did their albums, they surrounded themselves by with friends. Let's call them drinking buddies. And Harrison's health at this point had gone downhill. He had caught hepatitis. Uh, he was drinking. He had a cocaine problem. Yeah. And uh, he George had said that uh, I had to get hepatitis to quit my drinking. So maybe he got rid of some of the drinkers on some of this. I, I don't know that for sure. But certainly there's a different sound on this album. And, um, you know, Michael Palin of the Pythons had said that leading up to this time that Harrison looked tired and ill. So I, I, somehow he pulled it together and um, the illness caused him to miss the deadline to, to deliver this album to A&M Records and A&M dropped him. And because of the other artists that were signed to Dark Horse Records like uh, Ravi Shankar and Splinter and The Attitudes, these are Harrison type, uh, you know, led managed groups or, you know, they were from his stable, essentially. Those albums weren't selling. A&M said, screw this. He didn't, couldn't deliver the album in time. So Warner Brothers picked up Dark Horse and it was re released on uh, through Warner Brothers. Yep. And he got himself a new woman too. So that's probably another reason why this is a little bit brighter than normal. Well, it's funny you say that because he was getting together with Olivia during the making of Dark Horse. After all, she's on the label. Um, and there's a couple of love songs on Extra Texture. So... But I think by this stage, I don't know, maybe the relationship has settled down and it become a more kind of stable or, or I'm not sure. Yeah. I I, that, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think that all the litigation from the, the divorce from Patty would have passed by this time. And maybe that opened some things up to, you know, just a clearer path to Olivia. I yeah. mean, these things are, are very complicated, especially when you have a guy like Harris with all the money and assets it's not going to be easy to put on the, the plagiarism suit and you've got hepatitis and then slowly coming out of this here and we end, wound up with this great album. Yeah, interesting because the last track on the album, Learning How to Love You, maybe that, that was literally what he was going through. You know, he was just saying, okay, my wild days are over. I want to get back to being in a stable relationship again. I'm, I'm guessing that song was autobiographical. Um, yeah, I, I, probably so. And Beautiful Girl is uh, just a gorgeous ballad, I'm assuming, for Olivia. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, you had mentioned the last song, Learning How to Love You, the first song, Woman, Don't You Cry For Me. That song, I really, that song is the, a great album opener, one of George's yeah. best. And that song really gives you, puts the listener on notice as to what this new sound is like. And Willie Weeks' bass playing is yeah. way up front, and it's completely funky. It is, yeah. I was thinking that word as well, funky, um, which I guess was kind of prevalent at the time in terms of the 
the music scene. So nothing particularly new, but I, I think it really works on that song. And obviously it's an old song which he'd flirted with on All Things Must Pass and didn't work out. So I'm very glad he went back to it. Yeah, I mean... It, yeah, uh, outstanding guitar and outstanding musicianship, as you say, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what he was... I, it's a pronounced change from the prior couple of albums, even All Things Must Pass, really. And, and there is a little bit more of a separation of instruments here. And uh, I'm not sure what he was using for the mixing console or anything like that, but it really has a great sound. And the Beatles solo stuff, it te they tend to, I think add more musicians than are needed and there's not as much separation you know uh, the exception would be Lennon's first solo album but um here we get nice separation of the instruments which allows George's guitar to step to the front yeah because I think one of the criticisms one could level extra texture apart from the material maybe not being the strongest um although it, it's quite soulful um mm -hmm. is the production is it's just a bit muddy and some of those strings I I just see as artificial and just they, he just tacked on some strings to make it sound commercial like at the answers at the end and it ends up not really working and goes on too long blah blah whereas on here it's a lot tighter yeah and the song seemed he's not padding them out uh they seem to be the right length you know yeah. everything and the musicianship when they're in the fade outs uh, there's good soloing going on. So it's not um, a gratuitous long fade out just to fill space on an album. Um, he's had something to say and the musicians had something to say. So uh, I think um, we even hear that on the next song here, Dear One, which is, this is maybe one of slightly, it has a bit of a religious feel to it, but a great, great pop song. He really, he's he's found his pop sensibility on this album again. I agree. And really nice keyboards from David Foster, I, I guess, or maybe Billy. Um, really nice tune. And again, I'm not sure what that instrument is in the in the middle bit, you know, that kind of funky bass type. Maybe it's a keyboard. I'm not sure what it is. You know, the one I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, I do. Yeah. But it's effective, whatever it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now you had already mentioned the song Beautiful Girl which is probably about Olivia. Yeah. That is a, that's a very strong ballad. I mean, he, he, he's not one for writing a lot of ballads, but when he does, they're, they're strong. And I think this one is, uh, his, and his guitar playing on here reminds me of what he did later on Brainwashed. I, I've always paid very close attention to his guitar playing and he plays yeah. what he calls this cute slide. And on, on, it's got, he's got two different personalities when he plays slide. And this is the first time we see this kind of his more modern version of slide on this song. Yeah. And it works really well. Yeah. I think it's probably the strongest truck on the album for me, beautiful girl, mm. you know, in every respect, lyrically, mm -hmm. melodically, but just going back to dear one for a minute, I think yeah. I'm right in saying George harmonizes with himself, which is quite interesting. Uh, I don't think it's one of the other band members doing backing vocals. So I thought that was quite interesting because he hadn't hadn't really done that too much on prior solo albums, uh, putting putting in a harmony vocal, had he? I, you know, that's a good point. I, I know he did it on the next album quite a lot, which I think that's another yeah. reason why I love that album. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, when he harmonizes with himself, I mean, for a lack of a better uh, yeah. description, it sounds more beatly. Actually, I'm, I'm just reminded of don't, don't Let Me Wait Too Long. I think he harmonizes with himself on that, on that yep. one. Which one again, most, and one of his most beatly tracks. Sounds beatly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next so song. Bob, Bob Wolfenden, uh, mm -hmm. Matt, you know this uh, Ultimate Music Guide series. I don't know if you picked up the George Harrison one. But, um, uh, no, I have not. Uh, basically, he... Bob Wolfenden wrote that famous book the Beatles apart I don't know if you have it. oh yeah that one I do have if anything it's the lyrical weaknesses that are most glaring here since the album is interspersed with passages of quite pleasing guitar work so that's kind of <laughs> a bit of a mixed comment um yeah but I think the, the melodies are so strong here that the one almost forgets if the words are not the best but that's not always the case I think the words are very effective in many cases uh, the ones we've mentioned, Beautiful Girl, Learning How to Love You, mm -hmm. uh, Dear One. And um, may maybe they don't work quite so well on this song. Are we just about to come on to that? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would put, uh, since you mentioned lyrics, uh, yeah, the lyrics on this album, I think, hold up pretty well. But the the songs are so strong. This reminds me more, the Beatles, I think you can make the same uh, argument against the Beatles, where may, maybe their lyrics aren't as strong, but who cares? The melodies are so strong. That is the point of their music. And here, George Harrison, I don't think had to rely on lyrics. Though I would say that in the 70s, I, I think George Harrison has the best lyrics of the three ex-Beatles. Ha-ha. <laughs> I do. I really well, do. I think if I had to, if I, if you really push me on this, I think George's lyrics is uh, at his best when he's singing these gorgeous love songs to Olivia on this album and on the following one. Whereas when, when he's doing his religious stuff, it, it works some of the time, but on other times it can, can come across as a bit preachy. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I have a problem with that at all, because I've never found it a turn off, but um, yeah. But but it's a but it's a mixed bag though, Matt, because like this song, to me, is a thoroughly defensive lyric. And wh why didn't he just stand up and just admit he made a mistake? Why does he have to write this angry song saying he should never have been sued? I just don't get it. That's a good point. Uh, I mean, he clearly lifted that. I mean, and I think he had resentment because there was nothing said about it until the song was a big hit. I mean, the song had been covered by Billy Preston and nobody said anything because you're not going to make any money suing the Billy Preston for it. And I think he was aware of his, his fame and that's why they came after him. And he's, you know, just this anti-fame guy, but you're right. I mean, he could have just copped to it and said, Hey, yeah, I mean, I screwed up. Let's get this over with. Um, and this song is this song, the song, the song is, very typical George, and but the, I find in in the sarcasm, there's also great humor. Yeah, I, I get that, but you know, I I just find it defensive. And just going back to that, my sweet lord, can you not believe that Phil Spector or someone or Ringo would have just taken George aside during the recording of that track and said, "Listen, mate, <laughs> this is a bit similar." Um. Because just a little story for you in Liverpool at the Beatles week, we were out the other the other week. Uh, Joey Mullen from Badfinger was there, mm -hmm. and he was on the All Things Must Pass sessions. Yeah, and the interviewer said, "What did you think when George first play, played you, My Sweet Lord?" And he said, "I thought it sounded a lot like he's so fine." <laughs> <laughs> well, think of it this way: I mean, who's going to stand up to a Beatle? And I think I those yeah. I think those sessions were just big parties. So nobody was because paying attention. The next attention. question was, "What did you tell George that?" And Joey said, "Of course I didn't." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, who could have said something? Maybe Clapton, Ringo, of course. But Ringo made—I don't know. I mean, Phil Spector. Well, right? Spector. I mean, That's they, what he's the, paid for. Well, the thing about Spector is, according to Harrison, he was barely there, and when he was there, he was loaded drinking blackberry brandy or something, which is, I think, yeah, if well, you're going to get loaded on, why would you get loaded on blackberry brandy? Ugh. Talk about sugar. Right. But um, I yeah, think that... it was a it was an oversight. One of yeah. his buddies, Bobby Whitlock, anyone. Could well, you're right. I think it. that would have been Spectre's job. And uh, did, did Spectre he didn't produce that original song? Did he? He's so funny. Yeah. He did. No, no, not the original. I don't okay. think. No, but he would have been aware. Everyone was aware yeah. of it. it was a on no, both sides number one song. Of the Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another reason. Uh, that's another uh, check mark against Spectre for not doing his job. And he was already, he was washed up by that. And there's a reason he was washed up because he just was nuts. So, and he couldn't, he couldn't show up to do the job. So if uh, too many things fell on Harrison's shoulders and all things must pass, I think and that's maybe why it was, there was an oversight of that. He thought he could get away with it. Yeah. And actually, although I don't much like the song, I do like the video. I think it's a very, very effective video with Jim Keltner as the, as the judge. And um, that lady typist playing the piano. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, there's a, here we got videos here. So there's a lot of promotion for this album. And uh, yeah, it, it's a fun video. <laughs> it's a bit primitive. Yeah, I think of Brighton saying that this was the first album where he, he'd even done a promotional video, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah and he did three, no less than three. He did three, so, which is very yeah. interesting. But um, yeah. yeah, so I, I like the song. I, I I just think it's a fun song. I think it's got a good, it, not only is it cheery, but it, it's got, um, it's got a great melody and a nice solo. So I like it. And quite, quite witty lyrics and nothing bright about it. 
Yeah, they're very, very high on the wit in this song, which is yeah. the thing I have always appreciated about George Harrison's lyrics. Yeah, it was the song will let be, the song is in E. And that's a good line. I mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. <laughs> now, the next song is a very complicated, uh, uh, I would say, melody and time signature. And that's a song called See Yourself. And this one goes back to 1967 that he had started. I have no idea how much he had gotten, how far he had gotten on it at that point. But I don't know if you know the backstory. I think, well, I think he'd just written the first verse and then he, Lennon had always encouraged him to finish a song at the time, but he, he failed for one reason or another to do that. And Lennon admitted that even though he gave that advice, he, he wasn't particularly good at following it himself. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's a really, really good lyric, actually. And quite yeah. philosophical. I mean, I don't know about the bit about it's easier to kill a fly than it is to set it loose. So I don't, I don't, that's not a great line. But but some of the other lines, like you know, is he? It's easier to see the books upon the shelf to, than to see yourself. You know, basically saying, look in the mirror before you criticize other people. I think that's quite a good lyric. Yeah, I think the, the philosophical side of this song, which is not religious, it's just is just thought provoking. That's one of the things I like about George's music. This it's just got, uh, it makes you think. And yeah, he's got some very, very good stuff. And this was supposedly, he was inspired when the Beatles, when Paul McCartney admitted to taking LSD and the, the yeah. Beatles were, everybody came down on the Beatles because that came out. And that's, I think where this song originated from, you know, see your, look at yourself. Yeah, easier to tell a lie than it is to tell the truth. I think you're right. It did come from there. And again, that that's a very thoughtful lyric. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's good that he did resurrect some of these lost long songs, you know, because it's you can think of a few over the years where that, like Not Guilty came on the next album and Circles made it onto Gone Tropo, although that's not a great track. But some of these other tracks, as we've discussed, were quite old and he just dusted them down and made them good. Mm -hmm. I, and I have to point out the very strange time signatures in this song, which is somewhat of a trademark of George Harrison, which always made his songs difficult. And I think that's going back to the Beatle days. Some of these songs like this one wouldn't have gotten recorded. It was not easy to do, not easy to sing. Harrison's yeah. voice is, sometimes he writes songs for himself that aren't even suited to his voice. And I think that also makes it a little bit diff difficult just in the ranging and producing. Yeah, it would have been fascinating to hear the Beatles have a crack at this song, kind of mystery tour period. Yeah. But maybe... It, uh, it would have made total sense lyrically during that time too. Yep. Yeah. Yes, George always bought, brought some good uh philosophy to the band and i it's a shame this one wasn't wasn't explored more and maybe he didn't even bring it to the band i don't even know but yeah i don't think he did otherwise we would have probably heard it although mm -hmm. we haven't had the must mystery tour deluxe set yet have we so <laughs> <laughs> Are we, oh god that's that's one i would go and buy um i haven't bought the revolver one yet but uh we'll, well i just we'll... refuse to pay that kind of money but it's all freely available on the on Spotify so why would I go and spend all that money on because I, I, again when it comes down to it I'm going to listen to the outtakes two or three times and then go straight back to the original album so yeah I think this is this is a topic for another video because I yeah. I agree I think that um I always go back to the original it comes down to and the way I listen to music isn't typically on headphones anyway I don't sit around uh, yeah. just I, I used to do that more I don't have the time to do it as much now but uh yeah. Um, yeah. Well, All right. Let's save, save that for another video. Yeah, you bet. Well, let's flip over to 33 and a third and listen to the other side. So we start off by It's What You Value as a uh, lead off song from side two. And this is another George singing confidently. Uh, very, you know, phased vocals. And he's doing some different. You had mentioned the production. And did you, do you feel this song is maybe a little overproduced? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit slick, as I said, but it, but I, I think it works. I mean, I, I love Richard T's piano. I've tried, I've got the sheet music to this album and I've tried to like figure out how to play that and it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. So, and I really admire Richard T. He, he played with Paul Simon a lot and I love his keyboard work. He was famously on the concert in Central Park, Simon and Garfunkel as well. Um, so, 
yeah, maybe a bit overproduced, but I think, you know, an amusing lyric again, written about Jim Keltner not, not wanting to be paid in cash, but he wanted to be paid with a new car. So mm. George, <laughs> George just bought him a car instead ah. and, and wrote the song on the back of that, which I think is, you know, it's, it's not my favourite lyric in the world. It's a bit like the, the, the faster song on the next album is a superb song, but yes. lyrically I can... I don't really need a song about motor racing. Yeah, he was that lyric more generic as as we can discuss. But um, yeah, I, no, I I like this track. It's a very good opener to side two. I think he's he, the sequencing is very good on this album. Yeah, it's very good. And this is another song I would call Beatley. And this is we, he is harmonizing with himself on this song too. Yeah, I think you're right. He is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and this lead, upbeat. yeah, yeah, very much so. And, uh, you know, after, if you know the background, hepatitis, be, divorce, getting sued, you know, record label dropping you, scrambling to get a new release from a different uh, label, you know, and yet he's got all these positive songs. Yeah, I mean, compare, this is a piano-based track, compare it to some of the piano-based tracks on the previous album, like Grey Cloudy Lies. It's, it's chalk and cheese, isn't it? It, it really is. is, yeah. I don't, yeah, I can't explain it. Nor can I explain the next song, the Cole Porter song, True Love. Do you, do you like this one? I think it's a decent enough cover. Uh, it's a good song. You can't, you can't ruin a great song. But I think he, his comment was he thought Bing does it a bit too slowly. Well, I don't know about that. But uh, I think the guitar playing is lovely. And that kind of makes the song for me. Oh, OK. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I, I This is the only song in the album I don't like. and. Um, I, I think he did kind of ruin it a little bit with his vocal because I don't think his vocals, his voice is suited to this song. And I, I don't care for the guitar on it either. So yeah. I just find it from start to finish. Um, I I wish he had put another song on here. I'm not sure why he felt compelled to do this particular song, but he did. When it, Does the video not even save it for you? You know, I don't think I've seen this, the video for this one. I'd have oh, to we'll look at it. it. Maybe, maybe it? yeah, maybe that Hilarious. would help it. Is it? Okay, well, I'll he's check that out. Boat. He's in this boat on his river in Henley, and he's got this huge handlebar moustache with this sort of straw hat. And uh, he's with this woman who's not Olivia. I'm not sure who the woman is on the video, but it's a very funny video. Tongue so in he, cheek. Okay. You so and I a have a guardian angel, and there's an angel reading the guardian newspaper. I thought ah, that was quite funny. Okay. <laughs> That's very clever. Yeah. Well, uh, the, this song is followed by my favorite song on the album, which is Pure Smokey. And this song, I consider this one of his great um, solo pieces, particular, particularly his guitar playing. And I think this is kind of a sequel to the song uh, from Texture, Uber, which was also Uber Smokey Baby. Robinson. Ooh, baby. Yeah. Yeah. And when I talk about this, some people just think it's about marijuana. I said, well, no, it's about Smokey Robinson, supposedly. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I love the guitar on this. It's a, it's a very soft fade in. And Harrison has a couple. He's got an intro guitar solo. And he does yeah. a solo over the bridge. And both are just killer. And they're mellow, but they are very well played. And I, I don't know why he didn't do more of this in his solo career. I have, this is what I would have wanted from him. And um, yeah, glad he gave it to me here. It's very atmospheric, isn't it? And very soulful and a nice tribute. I hope Smokey was happy. Um, and just while we're on that topic, the, the last song on he did for Smokey, Ooh Baby, on Extra Texture, George could not have thought very much about it because he omitted it from his book, I Me Mine. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. It's not even in there. Hmm. Um, but I, yeah, again, that, that, that Ooh Baby has got a great bass line from, from Klaus, which kind of makes the song. And, and, and here, the musicianship is probably the highlight of the song for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do believe this song stands out in all of his solo work for that guitar playing. And uh, if people, if you haven't listened to it, Pure Smokey is one I would, I would highly suggest. Is Smokey Robinson still with us? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He must be about eighty-one or so. I tried. I've tried to get into his stuff, but I haven't really uh, been that successful. Have mm. you? I've been successful, and yeah. the reason I have been Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. There's no 
Sergeant Pepper type album or Revolver. He doesn't have a great album that's revered. He's got it's mostly singles, and the singles that I, I've that I really love. Some aren't that popular, but extremely strong. And his vocal delivery is just, you can't duplicate it. So yeah, I'm a big fan of his, but typically I just cherry pick some of the best songs and most of those are the singles. Yeah. I used to have a bootleg from the Let It Be sessions. Maybe you'll, you'll be familiar with it. And it was just George Harrison doing cover, cover versions of various tracks. And I'm sure Tears of a Clown or something was on there. But I've lost it. I don't know where it is. Um, mm-hmm. Did you ever have that? I didn't have that bootleg, but I do remember them doing um, uh, You Really Got a Hold on Me during those sessions. And yeah. they yeah. might have done one other one. I don't think they did Tears of a Clown, but I think they typically would fall into some Smokey Robbins and stuff, and it just kind of inspired them. Yeah, Smokey short, short, fat, funny was another track on that mm. bootleg, but that's not that's not Smokey, is it? That's, I don't uh, think so. Someone else. Yeah, Smokey Robinson. Uh, he's kind of as far as like, well, Motown. He, he's not as black sounding, but he's probably the the strongest melody writer. So that was kind of a nice mix for the Beatles to, I think, clam onto. They recognize the strong lyrics, and it wasn't too black for them to sing. Or emulate, and did he, I did guess. he write his own songs? Is Smokey you really Robinson. got a hold of me? As oh yeah, by... he wrote a lot of songs for Motown artists. He wrote the yeah. song "My Girl" for the Temptations and others. So yeah, he was prolific. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I must check him out. Yeah. We well, we are at Crackerbox Palace as the next track here, which was I think the lead single, at least the biggest hit in the states here, and uh, I don't think it was released in the UK. Yeah, I think it did quite well in this. Got to the top twenty, didn't it, in the US? Um, number, n- number nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. I just find this a bit too commercial. I, I know it's catchy and everything. It's a bit. It reminds me a bit of the Cloud Nine track. This is love. You know, it's catchy and all that. It just doesn't. It doesn't move me much. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a good song. It's yeah, top twenty. Yeah, but it's it's not his strongest single, and uh, yeah. it's, it's commercial and it. I don't know. It, it it did pretty well. I think part of it maybe had to do with some of the promotion that went along with it because it isn't one of his strongest singles. Well, yeah, the video again was very successful. Filmed in Friar Park again with Eric Idle. Or maybe it's Neil Innes pushing the pram at the beginning. Oh. I was so young when I was born and George comes out of the pram. You remember yep, that? Yep, I do remember. He's got <laughs> the big smile on his face. He's got his little yeah. his curly hair. <laughs> yeah. So that song, uh, we have one oh, more. Oh, I just remembered, Matt, the first mm-hmm. promotional video George did was for Ding Dong, Ding Dong from Dark Horse. I'd forgotten about that. Oh, that one I've not seen either. Yeah. They're all on YouTube, so you can go and okay. check them out. <laughs> <laughs> I will check that one out. So then we finish up with another love song here, uh, Learning How to Love You. And this song, I don't know if this is a for Olivia or if this is more of a uh, religious song either way it's a great song uh he's playing some wonderful guitar acoustic guitar it reminds me of his solo from till there was you i mean it's yeah. really very f- nicely done it's absolutely sensational i mean if you if I had to pick my top 10 top five george harrison love songs this would probably be in there the guitar solo is a killer as you mentioned the melody is great and i think i'm right in saying on on Spotify, there's a an alternate take or a demo for this track, which is really nice as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, and you know, it's a bit kind of you could say it was a bit close to Muzak in terms of the sound with the synthesizers, but I I, I don't. Uh, that was one of the criticisms of the following album, wasn't it? It was it's too middle of the road or it's too soft or whatever, whatever the hell that means. I yeah. Think it's yeah, I think the Beatles and quite a lot of their contemporaries from the 60s, by the time you get to the late 70s, they were falling into this kind of adult contemporary, I wouldn't call it music, but it was just a softer sound. You hear this from Crystal's yeah. Nash, we hear this from all kinds of contemporary uh, people. And I still, I agree with you, I think this is still a great song. I mean, there's a lot of music was changing at this point, and this may be 
felt a little bit uh, passe, but just not for the young people. But I think well, it's a great um, song. George Harrison was never the Clash, and neither was Paul McCartney and Wings. And I don't re- particularly want them to be, although you had Paul was trying to do that with Back to the Egg maybe a bit later. But uh, on the whole, they st- they stayed true to their selves, didn't they? And um, yeah, I think for the most part, that that's a good thing. Yeah, and then we have one bonus track, Tears of the World, which uh, didn't make it. Um, and, well, that, uh, that doesn't belong on on here, does it? I have no idea why that's a bonus track on the CD. When was that recorded? Out, you know, that's an outtake from the Summer in England sessions. It was one oh. of the four. It's one of the four tracks that Warner Brothers rejected. Got it. Okay. And just while we're on that topic, the other three lay his head. Flying Hour and sat um, singing, sat singing. Uh, to this day, unreleased on CD. I think, I think um, Flying Hour is on Spotify as an extra track on the self-titled, or it was. Maybe it's been taken off. But the other two, and I, I just no idea why they put this as a bonus track on on this album because it was recorded four years later. Yeah, good point. Well, if it, George was never really that particular about this kind of stuff you know i don't think he cared i mean and it probably shows there wasn't much oversight doesn't make much sense to the fans he doesn't personally have to supervise these releases but so you would you would have thought someone in his camp would do john if you want it done right you got to do it yourself (laughs) that's what i've learned (laughs) well yeah but then obviously now because we had the same discussion on all things must pass although he'd obviously passed away by the time the 50th anniversary came out but Again, a lack of research in terms of his team, in terms of interviewing all the people who are still alive who played on that album. It's just, it's a, it's a bit sloppy. And if you look on George's solo career on CD, very stingy on the bonus track front. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can think of artists like Elvis Costello and Paul McCartney and Bob Dylan. There's so much extra material they've released for the fans over the year and over the years. And George has almost done the opposite. And I don't can't quite work out why, because there's stuff there. I mean, there must be, right? <laughs> yeah, he's. But if you going back to the Beatles anthology, he he had made comments about releasing all this old, you know, bottom of the barrel stuff, and he he had kind of a, an aversion to it, I think. But it, you know, anniversary box sets and things—that's what fans expect, and people want demos and they want to see the building of the song, and that's I don't think it. It, it denigrates the original at all and uh yeah they, that's i that just was his philosophy i guess because he hasn't given us much yeah i mean if only just give us the the backing track for ding dong without the horns or something so you can hear the acoustic guitar and the drums and the bass that's just one example i can think of and or any any song where there's horns on the top i can in if you listen to got got to get into my life from the revolver sessions just fascinating to hear the guitar play the horn line yeah and, it's very true yeah you know, i'm sure you could find examples from george's career where you know the 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 stripped down version is every bit as enjoyable as you do one. yeah you do hear more of how good he was because some of that stuff does get lost in the mix and uh, if you're talking musicianship, sometimes those things do show through on these bonus tracks where they strip them down a bit. So, yeah, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the players. We alluded a little bit to some of the, the players on this album. And I think overall, this album is very different sounding than his previous three albums, in, in four albums, including All Things Must Pass. And he did make some changes here with personnel. And I think Willie Weeks, who did do some playing on the previous albums, he be- Came the full-time bass player on this album. I think that's one of the reasons why you have this funkier sound. And I think more importantly is uh, Alvin Taylor on drums. He dispensed with Jim Gordon and Jim Keltner, brought in a different drummer, and I think that really changed the sound for the better. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because Jim Gordon only really played on that U track, didn't he? Um, was mainly Jim Keltner he used on Material World Dark Horse Extra Texture. And I would never knock Jim Keltner as a drummer because look at his work on Walls and Bridges or 
you know, some of the Lennon stuff, um, I think it's more of a question of production. I really do. I think there was less care went into the production of Dark Horse and Extra Texture because Andy Newmark was also drumming on Dark Horse and he's a fantastic drummer. Yeah, and, I, I, yeah, and I don't want people to misconstrue that I'm knocking these players. I think sometimes they just, some some musicians work better together than others. And I've never found Keltner, he's just a great player. I mean, he was used all over the place. Doesn't mean he's it's going to work every time. And I just don't think that Harrison's songs work with him as well as they did on this album. I think that's one of the reasons. And um, I, there are, obviously we could probably pick up certain songs where the drumming on the prior albums are, are very good, but I'm just looking for a reason as to why this album sounds so different and yeah. to my ears so much better. I think the drummer, I, I, I just don't think production has anything to do with the drummer. The drummer is setting the tone and I think you can build from the, that's the foundation you build up from that. I think yeah. that's why this album is strong. And I think I got to give it to Alvin Taylor. And I, I'd also say, you know, getting in hundred percent with Willie Weeks was also the right thing to do. Klaus Vorman, you know, as, as nice of a guy as he is, people overrate his playing. And I don't think he's a strong player. And I think that he was brought into the Beatles sessions, the solo Beatles sessions, oftentimes, because he was a very good friend of theirs. And um, I can pick many places where I just find his playing unimaginative. And yeah. he he has his moments and uh, his playing on Lennon's first solo, solo album works. I'll give you an example of uh, Borman's playing. If you, one of his probably most famous songs is bass playing on You're So Vain by Carly Simon. He's got that very interesting intro and that leads into the song, but the rest of the song is just root bass notes. They're plotting, unimaginative. And I, I hear that song a lot on the radio and I've been listening to his playing. I'm like, God, this guy just, he just doesn't take it to another level. Weeks does. And yeah. I think that's a, a reason why this, this album makes you shake your ass a bit. Yeah, and then Weeks is obviously used on the following album to great effect as well, uh, where he teams up with Andy Newmark. I think that mm -hmm. that's another great rhythm section. Yeah, and have, you got, have you got many albums in your collection with Alvin Taylor on drums other than this one? I'd have to check. I don't even, I don't know his work that well. No, neither do I. Uh, I'll have to check it out because he, um, yeah. Yeah, when you and I discussed doing a George Harrison album because we were we've already done a paul and yeah. a john album we were deciding what well, do we do the george harrison 79 album or do we do this one and because i think they're both really strong and they they use a lot of the same musicians and and they're recorded a couple years apart too it's not like they were really getting off the vibe of this album yeah i was lucky enough to see andy newmark in liverpool he played in the the lennon the lennon's double fancy band concert with ah, okay. tony levin and earl slick Unfortunately, he didn't do a, a talk at the Adelphi and he, or a signing session, so we didn't get to meet him. But uh, his playing, he can still rock. He's just great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I um, the the keyboard playing on this album is split between Gary Wright and Billy Preston. And that's very strong. Both are great players. Gary Wright was well, and, and um, Dave, David Foster and Richard T. So there's. Yes, you're right, David Foster. I'm not sure I'm, if Gary Wright is on here, actually. Did I make a mistake on that? David his Foster. Picture's not, his picture's not on here. Hmm, but... Let me have a look here. David Foster plays the Fender Rhodes, which is kind of that Stevie Wonder. That's a uh, really great sound. Let's see what I got here. Yeah, he, he's in the thanks section, but it, I don't think he gets his picture on the inner sleeve. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I guess you're right. But I would I would say that if it's piano, it would be um, Richard T playing it. And if it's okay. organ, it would be Billy Preston. And if it's synthesizer, it would be David Foster. If I had to <laughs> split the keyboards, but it doesn't tell you, does it? So No, it does not. Well, let me see here on the inner sleeve. Does it? No, it doesn't. Well, um, since we're talking about the inner sleeve, the cover, I, I think this is one of his great album covers, actually. Yeah. The photography Brilliant. is great. And um, once in, what's interesting is George is playing 
he seems to be playing to an American audience with this album. We have this, the bicentennial glasses on, which we, if you were in the States, that was the 200th anniversary of the country. It was a big deal. Lots of stuff going on in the summer over yep. 4th of July and things. And uh, you've got this attractive cover with the um, embossed or the, um, uh, what do you call this? The um, Yeah, the silver lettering. The yeah, silver, yeah, nice. the silver plated uh, in, yeah. in, engraving on it. And uh, generally speaking, I think it just, he seems, I, I thought the last couple albums he struggled with the packaging, particularly Dark Horse. I thought that was not an attractive cover. It's not going to lure anybody in. Extra Texture I thought was interesting, but obviously his face wasn't on the cover. Here yeah. we, he, he does it upright. Yeah, that was great. I've, I've been on the lookout for a pair of those bicentennial glasses matt they don't tell me you've got one in your collection i do not but if i see them i'll pick a pair up for you john yeah please i mean i've even <laughs> gone on ebay oh have you and uh, i think there's a few fake ones out there oh. so i need to be careful um but yeah i wouldn't mind it would be great because i remember that summer of 76 the british are coming okay and all that yeah 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 it was uh it was a fun time and um <laughs> Unfortunately, this album, well, it did fairly well in the States. A couple of um, mis missteps here. Obviously, he had mentioned uh, he had to scramble to get a new distributor, which became Warner Brothers. And this album got to number 11 in the States, but only 35 in the UK. And um, one of the, the problems, this album came out late. It came out late in the year. It was supposed to be released in July, but came out in November. And the, the best of George Harrison album was released the same month. So here you have got these competing albums from two different labels that, that, I mean, you couldn't have planned it worse, but yet this album still got to number 11 in the U S yeah. The less said about that best of George Harrison, the better, I think. Um, yeah. Interesting how this album came out within a couple of weeks of wings over America, just to put it in perspective. Which oh, got did it? Okay. All the way to number one in the States. Mm -hmm. um, and he did quite a few promotional interviews, didn't he, for this, for this album? He did. And I don't remember him doing that before. I mean, you have videos, you had interviews, you had three singles from the album. I think there was at least two released in the States. But yeah. he seemed to really to decide to say, okay, I'm going to promote this the proper way. And I think it paid off for him. Yeah, not I just wish he'd done more UK. promotion for the next album because that kind of got lost in the mix commercially, didn't it? Yes, I agree. I that al album had hit album written all over it, and yeah. when I, I I bought that album, so that album was 1979, and we're talking, of course, of the George Harrison self-titled album. Yeah, I think I bought that in the very early 80s. So it, you know, I can't remember what year I bought that. It might have been 83, 84. Yeah, in in, in 1984, as a teenager. 1979 seemed like 20 years ago you know so I, I i didn't i i couldn't tell you too much of how that album was received at the time although retrospectively i know it was one of these it was kind of up against all the punk stuff and the beatles the beatles solo stuff was becoming passe yeah, and the least, sound at least in the u.s blow away did did crack the top 20 i think um well that's the you... song i thought could have been number one and yeah. i think the fact that he didn't promote it like he did this album I mean, if there was a promotional video with it or well, and, there was but it, was it's there? one of the worst videos ever recorded <laughs> in the history of music that do you remember wanna... he's he's sitting on this giant duck in plastic duck oh it's a terrible video <laughs> well maybe um, that hurt the song and I was I remember being absolutely heartbroken when it only reached number 51 in the UK because I thought this that was a number one single. I really did. Yeah, I can't say that a, a lot about the Beatles solo stuff because obviously McCartney hit number one many times. Lennon had a couple of number ones, George had a couple of number ones, of course, Ringo. But the song Blow Away was the song I thought was the big hit. And in the States, it got to, was it number 19 maybe? It got to number two on the adult contemporary chart, which goes back to what I said earlier, that that chart and older people that were not rocking out and listening to, you know, in through the outdoor were listening, gravitating toward the softer rock, which Harrison's music during this time, that's what it was. It was just, it was soft rock. 
well, it's interesting you mentioned in through the outdoor because I think even Led Zeppelin fans were annoyed at that album because they thought it was. <laughs> yes, very much so. And like I said earlier, like Crosby, Stills and Nash, if you listen to their 1977 album, I mean, they're they've lost their edge as well. So these guys were getting older, and you know, it's just part of the mature maturing of their music. I think because you're right, the Led Zeppelin fans were, hey, well, this isn't a, yeah this isn't Zeppelin three. <laughs> It's funny, Matt, whenever I listen to something like Talking Heads or Blondie, I just think, yeah, this this was the O current music at the time of 79. And then they go back to self-titled and it's obviously not anywhere close to what the, the kids were listening to. And that's, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, it does strike me that, yeah, they were playing to a different audience, I think adult contemporary as you said yeah and i think they're like a lot of these artists they their time had passed and the new time was for the talking heads and for the blondies and that that was the cutting edge music and it was great music and it's considered to be classic nobody considers yeah. these two harrison albums to be classic albums really although they're quite good and us fans consider them highly but it's well, just i'm, this, I'm this happy to say i like I like all three of uh, Talking Heads, Blondie, George Harrison. They're all up there for me. So, you know, I don't, I don't, not one who buys into this rivalry, you know, the Beatles versus the Stones and all the rest of it. Yeah, same here. I, I, it all exists at the same time. And I was listening to a lot of music. My, my band during this time were, were the Cars. I like the Cars. So that was oh, one yeah. of the few contemporary bands that I followed. And um, to me, that yeah. was just, wow, this is really different music especially Panorama, that album, which was 1980. And if you put Panorama, Panorama up against a, you know, um, sometime in, somewhere in England or some of that, it's just a completely different thing. And you can see the, who's on the cutting edge and who is not. Yeah, I, I got to say, my, my Best Friend's Girl is my favorite track from the cast. Oh, yeah, <laughs> good band. Yeah. Well, this album, as we said, um, I, I can't, Obviously, George Harrison's decline, which was much more pronounced in the UK than in the States. And other than some of the bands we just mentioned, can you think of any other reason why people were tuning out on George Harrison? I think he'd lost a lot of goodwill with the previous two albums because they'd all gone out and bought, uh, well, actually, let's think about it. Material World was number one in the UK. And then the very next album, Dark Horse, didn't even chart. Uh, yeah, I have got Material World at number two in the UK, number one in the US. So those are about as high as you can get. Yeah. Um, All Things Must Pass, number one, number one. Concert for Bangladesh, number one in the UK, number two in the US. You mentioned Living in the Material World. And Dark Horse, which charted at number four in the States, didn't even chart in England. So yeah. I think you're right. I think, and I, I think that they were right. They were right to not place that album on the charts. I think, I don't like that album. I think it's one of his weakest albums. Well, you know what? I think maybe the British fans were thinking, well, screw you, George. You can't even be bothered to tour the UK. We're not going to buy your album. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that's possible. I mean, he did the couple. Yeah, he didn't tour there, did he? No. He, hmm. he just did the one concert in 1992. And I was there in the second row. <laughs> ah, um, Brilliant. With Gary Wright on, not Gary Wright, Gary Moore on doing guitar duties mm -hmm. um just a brilliant concert uh yeah I, I i i literally made eye contact with him during the song i like to think i did mm -hmm. during all those years ago when he's singing oh, cool. they've forgotten all about god and i was singing along is the only reason we exist and as he sang that line he i could swear he was smiling at me but oh excellent <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's got to be a great feeling. I, you know, I've never seen him live, but um, yeah, he didn't. George Harrison, when it comes to the fans, he doesn't. He got. He also has an aversion to his own fans. I think just because of all this mania he speaks of, and he doesn't feel that he has to maybe give them as much. So, hence, we don't get the bonus tracks. We don't get the concerts. He doesn't go back to his own home country to do a proper tour. I don't know how that would have been received. That was not received the best in the States, although I think it's a little bit more exaggerated in hindsight that it was bad. And he, I mean, everybody wants to see a Beatle, but I don't know how um, English audiences would have re received that 1974 tour. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could have done with that. Well, I haven't seen it. Obviously, the footage doesn't exist, but um, 
I think it was a mistake maybe to do so much Ravi Shankar stuff. Uh, but as far as whether he should have played more Beatle material, I think that's that's a ridiculous argument. I'm quite happy for him to do material from All Things Must Pass, Material Worlds, whatever. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and it, and then when he did do the Beatles songs, he changed the words. Yeah, you know? I mean, he he doesn't get it. I mean, he it's it, he should have known better, and he, he was preachy, and we already knew those close to him he it's not like he would go on and off you know he'd be binging on cocaine and alcohol and then he'd be binging on meditation and he was just a you know we talk about lenin flip-flopping but harrison did a bit of that himself and i think it he paid the price for it yeah I mean, he should have listened to his own song it's easier to criticize somebody else than to see yourself i mean he wasn't exactly living the the example was he Oh yeah, Harrison. He he could he could dish out to the philosophy, but he didn't always live by his own words. That yeah. Oh yeah. Cheap. Hey man, talk is cheap. Talk <laughs> is cheap. That sounds like an album title. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. But anyway, this yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm glad we talked a little bit about uh, the self title album that followed this, which was three years later. Why did he, was he, do you know why he waited so long to do another album? Was he just out of gas or I guess? Well, it's actually, it's two and a quarter years later because it came out in February and this one came out in November. But okay. um, fair enough. But I think we, to do it justice, we should do a separate review on that one map because it's it's literally in my top 10 albums of all time. No no joke. Oh, really? So, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I, as far as Beatles solo albums, it's probably, boy, I, I have to think about that, but it's one of my, I would say it's top five for me. I think it's that strong of an album. And and there are some knocks. I don't, across the board, I mean, it is a bit soft. And I do resent him a little bit for not bringing the rock music in uh, his guitar playing. But, you know, great, great songs. Well, I mean, he, he was a songwriter. And I think he was trying to be singer-songwriter in the 70s. And it it didn't always work for him, but it does on in this later period. Yeah, well, it's interesting because like when you get to Gon Troppo and he's trying to be commercial and doing this horrible synthesizer song, Wake Up My Love, just terrible. What, what was he thinking? Just go back to what you do best, George. Well, I think he just is, was an out-of-touch guy. And he, the only reason the prior album did anything is because John Lennon was murdered and he did a song about it. That's the only reason that, song, that album did anything. It's not, I don't think that album is, is that good. And um, I just think that his time had passed and he just didn't, uh, he wasn't interested in following trends anyway. So he's left to his own stuff, which wasn't strong enough. Yeah, well, okay. It's a set topic for another video because I think all of the albums have their redeeming features, but I, but that particular track, Wake Up My Love is, is a disgrace in my opinion. <laughs> Um, yeah, I struggle with that album. I, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to search for some redeeming qualities. I'd really, I really, I haven't listened way, to it in a that's while. That's the way now. it goes. That's a good. Oh, track. that's a good. Yeah, that's a good track. I do like that yeah. track. But like the ultimate music guide, for example, gives "Love Comes to Everyone" two stars. I mean, what what planet are they living on? It's yeah, that whole album. I think, although it's very heavy on the ballads. I think that's partly why it gets knocked. And I think the ballads are strong. You know, the, one of the be better ones, uh, Your Love is Forever, yep. which the song is built on that, that um, I don't know if it's in, you know, the DC structure, which he had made famous on Here Comes the Sun. And it's a really beautiful song, beautifully, beautifully played. And um, most people do highlight that song as a strong album cut. And I, I think most people just never heard it. Well, it's their loss. Um, yeah, we'll probably cover this in a separate video, but Steve Winwood is playing great synthesizer on the self-titled album as well. Yeah. Well, now that we've kind of teased the audience a bit, maybe we do have to do that album. But I think <laughs> since we've done a George, Paul, and John album here, I think we're due for a Ringo album. I'm not quite sure how to approach that. Um, yep, I agree. Um, um, should we be brave and go for one of the maligned ones or should we go for an obvious one or well, somewhere in the middle well well 
Well, let's talk about it because uh, yeah. there's. A, I don't think there's a lot of choices. I, I'm 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 rather dismissive of almost all of his catalog. I mean, there are bright spots, and um, you know, I actually just listened recently to the Bad Boy album, and I it was better than the couple other albums that surrounded that, that I remembered. I was a little bit surprised because I was always you know I mean disco. Come on, Ringo. When the Beatles follow trends, they the solo Beatles follow trends. It doesn't work very well, and that goes for any of the four. And um, Ringo is a trend follower; he wasn't a trendsetter. Well, yeah, but then you could trace that all the way back to the standards album and the country album and the disco album. I I think that's just Ringo strong enough on his own. I would say the 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 uh, standards album and the country album. He was he was singing. He was going into a genre to sing a certain style. Disco was not a genre. It was merely a trend at that point and a, a much overdone trend. I wouldn't mind doing a video just on disco. It's actually kind of a fascinating period. But um, yeah, Ringo, uh, I don't, I, his his uh, association with Vinnie Poncia, I think was one of the worst collaborations of the decade. I don't think it worked at all. And I'm very- but Not dis- even, oh my, my. No. Oh. They got lucky that it charted. I think there was just it, the timing of that. They Beatle, it just worked for that time, that glam rock stuff. But it was that was the only time it did work. And some okay, hey man, okay. let me let me remind you that it, at least in the States, we had number one songs of my dingling and disco duck. So I mean it was a very strange time. I mean, I can't okay, explain Matt, that. If, if you get a chance, because I've really got back into Ringo the Fourth recently, pro- probably because I just met Tony Levin in Liverpool. But the okay. musicianship is just, uh, you know, you couldn't wish for a better band. Steve Gadd, Tony Levin, Dave Spinoza, Richard T, who plays on 33 and a third. Um, just, just, uh, and just, you know, far better than all the peace and love stuff he's been coming out with for the last 20 years, in my opinion. But anyway. Mm. Yeah, I would say that a lot of Beatle fans end up talking about what great players were on the album instead of, hey, how about we talk about the songs? I think the quality... I mean, the greatest band in the world can't do anything with a shit song. So that's okay, my opinion well, I, anyway. I, oh but, uh, but we could talk right. about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's some quite good songs on the album as well. But anyway, go, check it out. Give it another chance, Matt. I will. Know. I will. I've been in a Ringo mood lately. I've just been listening to the country album. And um, I, I think that I, I I never rated it as high as I do now. And, you know, it, it took some listens for me. But talk about... That's that works better for me than his later 70s stuff. And um well, just so you know, my son Tommy, who's turns 21 today, actually, yeah. uh, I caught him the other day literally listening to Ringo the Fourth, the whole album. I said, really? I said, well, what you listen to Ringo the Fourth? He goes, Yeah. I said, It's quite good, isn't it? He goes, Yeah, it's pretty good. So <laughs> I'll have to give that one another listen. I listened to that. Uh, I think about six or eight months ago, because I've been working on getting into the Ringo stuff, you kind of preparing to do something with you in the future on, on Ringo, yeah. not quite sure how to approach it. Uh, but I think Ringo's, the way I talk about Ringo, I, I tend to want to talk about his, his, his catalog as almost a whole, or at least the 70s period, roughly, and then his kind of fall off the face of the earth, and then kind of his comeback, and uh, kind of approach from that period, because I, I think uh, his his he does have bright spots throughout, and I'd like I'd like to talk about the bright spots so, uh, more so. It's easy; it's too hard to just deal with one album because well, I find maybe, few bright spots. Maybe we can tackle "Time Takes Time" because that's obviously a very strong latter day. Well, it's not. It's I say latter day. It's thirty years old. Uh, I know. It's <laughs> that's one of the albums that uh, fans I find really find strong, and I I agree with that. Uh, that's the album that needed to come out in 1978, but you know it just didn't work that way. Yeah, and by the time it did come out, it didn't chart anyway, so it's a shame. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the Beatles. I mean, Ringo really probably, although some of the good stuff that we know didn't chart, he had some bad stuff that did chart. So it kind of evens out, I guess. I mean, the No No song, yeah. You don't like that? No, I mean, I think, well, we'll talk more in the Ringo video, but yeah, I don't don't like that one. You're a hard man to please, Matt. 
Well, I can't like everything, John. You know, I, th I think it's fair to, you know, I mean, these Beatle guys here are really, uh, they're just guys, you know, and they sometimes they, to bring them down to earth a little bit makes them more like us. And I think it makes them, uh, make us, makes us love them a little bit more uh, and I, more I on just, the ground. I just find it highly amusing that Ringo is smoking a lot of weed, taking a lot of Coke and drinking a lot of brandy and daring to sing a song like No, No Song. I, just I think, think that's how the seventies was. I mean, the cocaine yeah. used to be advertised as, as being healthy for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it was strange times. Yeah. Very, self, very indulgent, you know, but um, that was the lifestyle and they were living the rock and roll lifestyle. Have you ever seen that Nancy Andrews put out a book a few years ago, very nice pictures from her time with various people. She was obviously oh. with Ringo for five years. She was with, who was it? Uh, Leon Russell. Um, there's pictures of her with George. There's a lot of good pictures. So it was a limited edition book came out. A few was years it ago. a was it a photo book or was it more um, mainly photos? A, a bit of sort of caption dialogue, but mainly photos. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting time for him. Um, it would be interesting to get a full book on that period of his because that's when he was. Kind well, of that, that's the period. Alcohol, you know, he said he he'd literally forgotten a few years. Yeah. Um, and as a re direct result, he didn't, he doesn't, hasn't put Rotogravo, Ring of the Fourth, and Bad Boy on Spotify, or his team hasn't. And they're the only, the only albums missing, hmm, presumably yeah. because he can't remember them. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Well, I, I think, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure why he wouldn't. You could put those in a box set, you know, you just had McCartney one, two, and three. I mean, people would buy it, they buy everything. But I, th I think some of his 70s stuff is worth looking into. And if Ringo never embraces it. I mean, he all through the years he's been doing Ringo's All-Star Band, he plays very few solo tracks. And it would have been nice for him to do a couple album tracks here and there for the fans that are big fans. Yeah, for example, he's never done Snookaroo in concert. It's probably another song that you hate. Not a big fan, but I mean, I, that was a hit, though. I mean, I could see him doing it. I mean, that would make sense for him to do it. Yeah. Yeah, um, but you know, or some of those other songs from the Ringo album. He's got some great songs on that album that he never did live, and um, it's too bad. Step lightly, yeah. Step lightly, yeah. <laughs> Sunshine life for you. Oh, that's not a good one. You don't like that one, do you? <laughs> I actually do like that one a little bit. Yeah. Oh dear. I do, I do, yeah. I that's do. one of George Harrison's least distinguished compositions. And that's why I gave it to Ringo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ringo's not distinguished. <laughs> All right, John. Well, let's bring this in for a close and um, yeah. another. I another just hope, I, I just discussion. hope Vinny Ponce is not watching this video. Well, it, I don't blame him individually. I mean, sometimes unions just don't work. You know, it's not <laughs> the individuals. It takes two sometimes to succeed. It takes two to fail. And, you know, I mean, Vinny's got some other great successes. They just weren't really with Ringo, you know, so. Okay. Good to, good to speak, Matt. Good. Very enjoyable, and we'll, we'll talk about what we do next time, yeah? We will. Very good. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. See you. Take care.